Many people have heard of Josef Mengele, one of the evil Nazi doctors who performed gruesome experiments on inmates at the Auschwitz extermination camp during World War II. Mengele's reputation as a mass murderer is enhanced by the fact that he actually seemed to like another one of his duties, choosing those who would live or die at the infamous Zelección process, where newly arrived Jewish prisoners and others would be chosen for immediate death in the gas chambers or for a short life as a slave laborer. Oftentimes, Mengele would offer to take the Zelección duty of others, many of whom would do what they could to get out of it. Mengele was not a stupid nor brutish man. He held two doctorates, two, and any historian knows how rigorous the MD and PhD programs of Germany were, and still are, but Mengele did not see his victims as human beings, just objects to experiment on and eliminate, all for the greater good of Germany or science. Shiro Ishii was much the same, a brilliant doctor who had reached the pinnacle of his field in Japan before World War II, who became a monster during the conflict. Mengele escaped justice, Shiro Ishii and his partner in crime Masaji Kitano escaped justice too, except they didn't take it on the run. No, they lived out the rest of their lives in comfortable surroundings, free to come and go as they pleased. What's more, the American government knew exactly where they were, as did most anyone who cared to find out. Why? because the United States government, specifically its intelligence community and military, wanted to know what Shiro Ishii and Kitano knew. Before we go on, if you haven't watched our video, The Unspeakable Things That Happened in Unit 731, go ahead and watch it before going any further. Because this video is about Unit 731's leader and his deputy commander, and why they got away with some of the worst crimes in human history. Those crimes are described in that video. Before World War II, or better yet, before Japan's invasion of China in 1937, Shiro Ishii and Masaji Kitano were respected medical researchers. Ishii had graduated from the prestigious Kyoto Imperial University in 1916, and Kitano from the equally prestigious Tokyo Imperial University in 1920. Both later received their PhDs in the study of infectious disease and related areas. Kitano was particularly interested in the effects of disease and injury on the intestines and digestive system. By all accounts, Shiro Ishii was brilliant, but a strange and unpleasant person to be around. During his college career, he grew different kinds of bacteria and kept them as pets in petri dishes in his room. These pets weren't some post-adolescent way of getting attention or standing out in a crowd, as high school and college students often do when trying to find themselves. No, apparently Ishii really treated the dishes full of bacteria as friends, talking to them and seemingly preferring their company over that of his fellow students when they asked him to go to social events. He also seemed to be one of those people who viewed most other people as objects to be used or which got in his way. Many of his colleagues at school described him being pushy and indifferent to the work that they were doing themselves. It also seems as if Ishii was most comfortable being alone in a lab. He would often study and work at night when others were asleep. In the Japanese culture of then and now, antisocial behavior of this type was, and still is to a certain degree, frowned upon. What's more, Ishii further alienated his colleagues by messing up the lab everyone used, and had cleaned up the prior afternoon. In the morning, when they went into work, they would find the laboratory in disarray, with dirty equipment strewn all over. Despite his social awkwardness and arrogance, Ishii managed to court and marry the university president's daughter. They had four children. Ishii's marriage allowed him access into pretty rarefied and elite company, and he took advantage of it. In the US and England, we'd call him a social climber, 
and like many social climbers, once he achieved a certain position, the people who had helped him on the way up became more of an irritant to Ishii than a help. This was likely not the case with his wife and her father, but other students, teachers, and after he joined the army, other officers all gave accounts of Ishii behaving in an extremely haughty and arrogant manner towards them, and many people made it a point of avoiding him. However, as time went on, Ishii found more and more people like him in the army, extreme Japanese nationalists who had begun to view the Japanese people as a superior race. He also began drinking heavily, and used army funds for his own enjoyment, mainly womanizing. Like many talented people throughout history, many of Ishii's faults were overlooked. First, there was his rank. And second, he was regarded as a brilliant medical researcher. Ishii joined the army and climbed the officers' ranks. By the time of Japan's invasion of China in 1937, Ishii had attained the rank of senior army surgeon second class, the equivalent of lieutenant colonel. During World War I, the Japanese army sent him to Europe to observe battlefield medical and weapons development on the Western Front. This was not unusual, since the mid-1800s, army officers had joined the forces of their allies as observers, hoping to stay abreast of new military developments. What fascinated Ishii the most were the use of deadly poison gas and the spread of disease in the crowded and unsanitary conditions at the front. He was also interested in the possible use of bacteriological weapons at the front, and spoke with some of the leading allied authorities in this field, which never truly got off the ground for many reasons, including ethical ones. In 1925, the Geneva Convention had outlawed bacteriological weapons, but Ishii saw this as confirmation of what he already believed. The disease could be an effective weapon on the battlefield and beyond. He urged the army and the Japanese government to continue studies in the field, and he was one of its leading figures. Ishii also became a well-known and wealthy inventor in the 1920s. He developed a unique water filtration system that was later used by the Japanese military, and in a way, the respectable and innocent-sounding name that was given to his command at the beginning of the war, Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwantung Army No. 731. His wealth, experience in World War I, and relative fame made Ishii an important man in the Japanese army, and the Japanese medical field in general, and when war broke out in China, his wish was granted. A laboratory in China to study the effects of disease, cold, gas, and injury on living people. By this time, Japan was firmly in the grip of the same kind of racist authoritarianism that had infected Germany, and the Chinese in particular were seen as inferior beings, of no real consequence other than to serve Japan and its people, in any capacity. Masaji Kitano followed a similar path. He graduated from medical school in 1920, and was commissioned in the Japanese army as a lieutenant army surgeon. He began study in his specialty, infectious disease, perforations, holes in the intestines in a bacteria-borne disease called Shigella, which was discovered by a Japanese doctor in 1897. In 1925, he got his doctorate and in 1929 was promoted to third-class army surgeon. In 1934, he taught hospitals in the United States, got another promotion in 1936, and became a professor in the newly established Manchu School of Medicine in Manchuria, which Japan had conquered in 1931. Throughout the period 1937-42, Kitano was intimately familiar with Unit 731, and became its commander after Ishii was promoted to overall command of Japan's medical experimentation units. Unfortunately, Unit 731 was not the only unit or place that the Japanese established laboratories where they carried out inhuman experiments. By now, you've watched our video on Unit 731, 
you know they carried out hideous experiments on living people that included infecting them with all kinds of deadly diseases, including plague. They performed autopsies on live, conscious people in order to see the effects of disease before the effects of decay set in. Infected people with social diseases enforced pregnancy to see if and how these diseases were spread to the unborn. Exposed people to cold, heat, low air pressure, thirst, x-rays, burns, much else. They also intentionally spread plague, typhus, and cholera in northern China. At Unit 100, which was set up to study the effects of germ warfare on cattle and horses, people were given transfusions of horse blood to see if it was possible to create a plasma product from the animals. It was not, and the victims died excruciating deaths. Estimates of the number of victims of Unit 731, etc., run from 25,000 to hundreds of thousands, when disease spread in the countryside is taken into account. Not only did the men and women who served as nurses of Units 731 and 100 carry out these grisly experiments, they attempted to hide their deeds from the world by referring to their victims as logs or monkeys, in much the same way the Nazis called the victims at Auschwitz cargo. When World War II ended, Ishii had faked his own death and was hiding in Japan, but the Japanese authorities knew where he was. The American occupation forces knew much about him and insisted that the Japanese turn him over, which they did. He was interrogated by officers from Fort Detrick, the American Army's center for the study of biological weapons. Though the Japanese of Unit 731 had destroyed many of the files they kept during the war, it was believed Ishii not only had much of what survived, but had personal knowledge that might advance American understanding of biological weapons. As you can probably guess, the Americans were not allowed, both by law, professional code, and ethics to experiment on living human beings. So they did the next best thing interviewed Ishii, his surviving staff, and Masaji Kitano, who had been captured in China but sent back to Japan in 1946, as part of an agreement between the nationalist Chinese government and the US occupation authority in Japan. Ishii was not a stupid man. He understood that the US authorities could do anything they wanted to do with him, including sending him to the Soviets, who wanted him as a war criminal. The evil doctor knew that being in the hands of the Americans was much preferred to being in Soviet hands, so he struck a deal with the Americans. He would give them all the information he had in return for immunity from prosecution in the war crimes trials then beginning in Japan, and not to be turned over to the Russians. By the fall of 1945, relations were already frosty between wartime allies America and the Soviet Union. By 1949, the Cold War would be on, and both sides had been and would continue to look for any edge they could have over the other in any future conflict. Two of those areas were chemical and biological warfare, and Ishii was an expert in the distribution and effects of both. The same held true to Masaji Kitano, who was also wanted by the Soviets and who was also part of the deal that kept many Unit 731 war criminals safe from prosecution after the war. To be fair, there were many American military and civilian leaders who wanted Ishii and Kitano tried and punished for their crimes, and they were to be called before the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, but both the American intelligence community and General MacArthur, the all-powerful military ruler of Japan until 1949, intervened on the basis of national security, and prevented the court from calling Ishii, Kitano, and others from testifying. With all that said and done, it's widely believed that the information gathered at Unit 731 was of any real use to the Americans, and that most of the data collected by Ishii, Kitano, and their staff was relatively useless. 
Though it's believed that Ishii did not divulge the whereabouts of some of the documentation he was able to take out of China before the end of the war. Shiro Ishii died in 1959. Some believe that after the war, he briefly went to Fort Detrick in Maryland to advise on the American bioweapons program. Others believe he stayed in Japan, where he opened a small local clinic. Kitano had a brighter future. He founded a pharmaceutical company and the first commercial blood bank in Japan. In 2001, the company Kitano started became part of Mitsubishi Pharma. Yes, that Mitsubishi. The people who made fighter planes during the war and cars and much else after. He died a free and rich man in 1986. He was also a pallbearer at Shiro Ishii's funeral. The two stayed in contact after the war and attended reunions of Unit 731 together. We hope you found this video interesting, even if disturbing and infuriating. Please like and subscribe to our channel to help us produce more. Thank you for watching.